Good morning, and welcome to the Harvard Forum uh, at the School of Public Health here at Harvard. Uh, we are here today to talk about big weather and coastal cities. Uh, the subtitle is Resilience in the Face of Disaster. Uh, my name is Tom Zeller. I'm a reporter with the Huffington Post, which is collaborating with the forum today to bring you the program. Um, Obviously, the impetus for us being here was the storm, uh, the superstorm that slammed into the East Coast about six weeks ago now, uh, called Sandy. Um, that storm, uh, I believe, if my statistics are right, uh, left dozens dead. It ravaged coastal infrastructure. It put millions of homes and businesses with, out of power. Uh, and it forced everyone to begin thinking about how we better prepare our coastal cities for these types of disasters, uh, particularly if, as climate models suggest, we're likely to experience more of this sort of thing. Um, I think it was just on Friday President Obama requested some $60 billion in federal aid uh, to address some of uh, the impacts in the states that were hit. Um, and so I can think of no better group of folks uh, to help us start wrapping our minds around these and other questions, and I hope you all have uh, questions for them as well. And I'd be honored to introduce them. Uh, just here to my left is Richard Serino, who, is, uh, who has been since 2009 the Deputy Administrator of the Federal Emergency Management Agency, uh, where he works to, and I pulled this quote from the web, uh, to build, sustain, and improve the department's capacity to prepare for, protect against, respond to, recover from, and mitigate all hazards, which sounds like a very tall order. Um, prior to his appointment at FEMA, uh, Rich spent 35 years working in emergency preparedness and response roles for the city of Boston, including as chief of Boston's emergency medical services and assistant director of the Boston Public Health Commission. So, welcome. Uh, next to Rich is Paul Bittinger. Uh, he is Chief of the Division of Emergency Preparedness and Medical Director of Emergency Department Operations at Massachusetts General Hospital. Paul is also an Assistant Professor at Harvard Medical School and Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, and he was also one of six members of the Mass General Staff who were deployed to uh, New York City uh, to help with relief efforts in the aftermath of Sandy. So welcome, Paul. Uh, then we have Gerald Caden. Uh, Gerald is a lawyer and city planner, uh, and he is the Frank Backus William Professor of Urban Planning and Design at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Uh, Gerald specializes in urban planning and land use law. Uh, he's been a principal investigator of a Harvard Netherlands government project on climate change, water, land development, and adaptation. Last spring, he co-taught a seminar at the Design School, uh, which was called Urban Responses to Sea Level Rise, very appropriate, uh, which looked, among other things, at coastal adaptation strategies being deployed in a variety of places, including Boston, London, the Netherlands, New Orleans, and Venice. Welcome, Gerald. And uh, he co-taught that course with uh, our last panelist, Dan Schrag. Uh, Dan is the Sturgis Hooper Professor of Geology at Harvard University a professor of environmental science and engineering and the director of the Harvard University Center for the Environment. He also serves on President Obama's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. And Dan is particularly interested in how information on climate change from the geologic past can lead to better understanding of human-induced climate change in the future, which is right square at the center of our discussion today. So. Uh, as I noted at the outset, uh, the storm itself seemed to raise a lot of uh, important questions about coastal cities, about resiliency, about uh, how we can ensure that uh, our coastal communities are able to bounce back from, from more frequent, more violent storms. Um, how do we ensure that? How do we get the, the uh, political uh, capital to make that happen? Um, how do we deploy our resources so that we can respond more quickly if we're not responding quickly enough? These are the sorts of questions I'd like to get at, and I'd like to ask each of the panelists to take a couple of minutes to uh, share their ideas about what resiliency and maybe adaptation mean in, in the aftermath of, of a storm like Sandy. Maybe we could start with you, Rich. Sure. 
I think a, a couple of things. As you look at the aftermath of Sandy, um, having had the opportunity to actually be in New York, um, be in New Jersey um, from about a day after the storm struck for about four weeks. And I think is importantly um, the preparedness that we did in the week or so getting ready for Hurricane Sandy to strike land. Um, a lot of people think that a lot of activity happened right after the storm struck, where in reality a lot of it happened in the weeks ahead of time. Uh, once we sort of followed that the hurricane's path of where it was going to go, um, we actually started running different models up and down the coast as to what we'd be able to look at and how we'd be able to respond to that. And the preparedness also happened actually a lot of time before that. Um, in preparation uh, for a hurricane throughout the season and for along major coastal areas as well as cities, a lot of pre-planning had been done. And that helped in the resilience of people of how they were able to respond. Um, and more importantly, um, there were lives lost. But because a lot of people prepared, a lot of people listened, a lot of lives were not lost as well. A lot of lives were saved because people evacuated, people took mitigation mm. air issues and were able to prepare for the storm coming. And that made a big difference. As well as, um, as the storm was approaching different areas in New York and New Jersey, took various protective measures. For example, in New York along the subway system, they shut down the subway before the storm yeah. hit. Even though the subway was out for a while, the actions they took ahead of time made a significant difference in how quickly they were able to restore service. Um, in addition, I think, you know, as you people look at how they're able to prepare uh, for a disaster, what people can actually do uh, on an individual level, it's not just government. As we call it, it's really the whole community. It's bringing together uh, the federal government, but also state, local, tribal governments to work together in able ability to respond. It's also bringing together the faith-based community who do, you know, huge amounts of work. I don't think people realize the amount of work that the faith-based community does, whether it's the Southern Baptist, Catholic Charities, mm -hmm. um, countless uh, religious organizations that are actually able to actually help out uh, during a disaster, as well as bring together the private sector. The private sector plays a huge role in disaster and having people at the table um, and re really able to, to, to come together. So it's, it's not just FEMA. It's not just saying. FEMA. FEMA actually plays a more of a coordination role. FEMA is mm -hmm. actually a very small part of the overall team yeah. that responds. And probably the most important part of the team is the public themselves mm -hmm. and engaging the public to make a difference and make it okay yeah. for public to, for neighbors helping neighbor. And we watched and we saw neighbors helping neighbors saving lives all up and down the coast. Yeah. I, I want to come back to you on the, the, the role of FEMA and how that all plays out, but let's ask Paul about... Well, I want to pick up a little bit on what Rich was saying yeah. about planning and preparedness and what happens before an event uh, and how Sandy may or may not change that. Uh, I think in the healthcare sector, if we look just in the, in the healthcare world, um, there was so much that was done prior to Sandy to try and be ready for something like this. Um, as far back as Katrina, there were a lot of unfortunate lessons learned about hospitals and their ability to withstand uh, significant storms, uh, the evacuation efforts that happened, uh, and unfortunately some lives lost during uh, evacuations. Um, since that time, th there's been a national focus to really harden facilities, meaning making them tougher, more uh, resistant to the effects of, uh, of hurricanes, uh, and, and try and make it uh, so that there would be fewer lives lost uh, with, uh, with uh, storms hitting hospitals. On top of that, there's been quite a focus on hospital evacuations, and if an evacuation is required, uh, there's been funding, there's been planning guidance, uh, there's been an e emphasis on trying to help hospitals be able to evacuate uh, better than they previously uh, have sometimes in the past. So there's been an awful lot of uh, work done on this uh, across the whole uh, country. Um, again, some with federal dollars, some with guidance, but also just at the local level, each institution doing it uh, on its own with its State Department of Public Health. Um, and I think it's interesting when you start looking at what's happened in the last two years to, to apply this to what we learned from Sandy and actually the hurricane before it in Irene. Um, based, I think, on some of the lessons we learned from, uh, from Katrina, uh, there, were, uh, there was a real emphasis on evacuating hospitals for Hurricane Irene uh, from New York City, the hurricane that came last year uh, to, to uh, the New York area, but really didn't strike New York with, with nearly the intensity uh, that was uh, forecast. 
and uh, nearly 10,000 people were evacuated from hospitals and nursing homes in the New York area in preparations for Irene. And there were a lot of questions about the cost, about the threats to patient safety uh, of distributing those patients so far away from their families, from their primary caregivers, the doctors that knew them most. Um, and though that was a successful evacuation, there were questions, I think, about whether that was the right tack to take. Um, so when Sandy came, I think people were trying to be very thoughtful uh, mm -hmm. about when to evacuate and whom to evacuate. Uh, they'd also made tremendous in investments in infrastructure, uh, moving generators from the basement to the 13th floor uh, of, the, uh, of the hospital, trying to be ready for the attack. But I think what's interesting is, is you see that we look back a lot. We look back at Katrina, we look back at Irene, we're looking back at Sandy right now. But some of the lessons that we learned about what storms we could uh, face didn't quite pan out. Uh, yeah. One of the hospitals uh, that did have to evacuate built a, uh, a concrete shelter around its fuel pumps still in the basement uh, that would fuel the generators. And it was ready for a 12-foot storm surge. And there was an almost 14-foot storm surge, and therefore the <coughs> generator failed. And I think the, the challenge is, is if we only look back, if we only think of what we've yeah. just been through or what were the lessons learned, mm -hmm. um, we're not likely, unfortunately, to face the future challenges, especially as I think uh, the other panelists are going to help us understand the future is changing. Yeah. We're going to have to find ways to both look back and look forward in a way that will help us be better prepared. Which is really about adaptation, right? And Gerald, maybe you can talk a little bit about what yes, that means. Well, the, the field of climate change has a, a bunch of terms, and there's the term resilience, but there's also the term adaptation. And adaptation describes a planning approach that prepares cities today for problems coming tomorrow, but the time scales of today and tomorrow are, are a little bit different. I mean, preparing today may be preparing over the next decades for events that may occur, you know, in even more decades beyond. So it's a much broader scale. And with water in, in particular, we're dealing with the water trifecta, which is permanent uh, sea level rise, uh, stormwater surge uh, from storms, and increased precipitation. All of those things end up with more water in urbanized areas. Um, and they bring risks, of course, to people. And people, by the way, have subsets of people because there are wealthier people and less well-off, more vulnerable populations. And also damage to property. So that's what we're dealing with. And I've been doing an interesting project over several years with the Dutch, uh, who, of course, have been dealing with these problems for centuries. In fact, the Netherlands itself is a country that has been more or less created out of water through something they call empoldering, or the creation of polders. But 50% of the Netherlands is below sea level. 60% of its population is below sea level. 70% of its gross domestic product is below sea level. So if they don't get this right, um, they have a real uh, problem. Now, they haven't always gotten it right, even though they've existed for centuries. And in fact, they had their Hurricane Sandy, but it was even more catastrophic in 1953, a flood uh, that covered uh, 600 square miles. But more importantly, roughly 1,800 people were killed in that flood. And they vowed after that, uh, never again will we allow this to happen. And they changed the scope of protection from protecting against an event uh, every 100 years or 1,000 years to Every 10,000 years, that's what we want to think about. One event in every uh, 10,000 years, and we're going to protect up to that kind of level. And so they had a water is our enemy kind of philosophy. They introduced uh, the Delta Works project, which built dams and dikes and levees and engineering miracles of, of barriers to deal with stormwater surge. And they've been very, very successful. And after one of the last barriers was built, and I, I just love this quote in 1968, Queen Beatrix uh, famously declared, at least from my point of view, quote, the flood barrier is closed. They had just built. The Delta works are completed. Zealand is safe. Now, those are, of course, words that come back to haunt in, uh, in the face of climate change, which poses uh, greater risks going forward in the future to the Netherlands, with sea level rise in the North Sea, with increased glacial melting that results in uh, additional water uh, coming down the rivers of the Rhine and the Issel and the Meuse and the Waal, um, and changes in precipitation generally. So the Dutch response now was the formation of a national delta commission and the creation of a national water plan whose dates would run to 2100, in other words, for the next basically 90 years. And finally, they have a new approach, which I characterized as water is our friend. It's a huge change in policy, 
and culture attitude. Uh, they have a room for the river project where they push back development off of lots of different rivers so that you can no longer develop close to the river. They're building for the first time or considering building outside of the dikes. The dikes have been the protection in the Netherlands. They're now talking about actually building in the water with some fanciful but real projects, floating islands, but not being protected by the dikes anymore. They're talking about building super turps, which are elevated areas, or hybrid dikes. Their whole approach has changed, and I think it's something that we need to think about and learn about, and it's just fascinating that they come to us to talk about ideas. It shows how open the Dutch are, who are literally the world's experts yeah. on this, to coming for new ideas elsewhere. So uh, given all that, is, is, is Sandy sort of a catalyzing moment for us? Where does, where does that take us from well, here? I think, I think that's interesting. So from my perspective as a climate scientist, mm -hmm. Sandy was a special point for a number of interesting reasons. When you look back at Katrina now 10 years ago, when you look back at um, uh, uh, even Irene a year ago, mm -hmm. a year and a half ago, you didn't have the public conversation about climate change to the extent that you do now. You didn't have the discussion of vulnerability and adaptation the way you do now. Those were big disasters. Politically, Katrina was a much bigger deal in some yeah. ways than Sandy. Although Sandy, of course, was in the midst of a presidential election. I mean, we have to remember there was a, there was a tension going on that was huge. But, you know, a week after Sandy, you had Mayor Bloomberg mm -hmm. coming out and endorsing the president, he said, partly because of his position on climate change. That was a very big deal. And uh, I don't exactly know what it was. Maybe it was the heat wave and the drought last summer. Maybe it was a number of other events over the last few years. But for some reason, Sandy... Um, has been connected by the public to climate change in a way that other storms have not, and it, which I think is an interesting mm -hmm. phenomenon. Um, there are a number of scientific ways that actually that's a legitimate point, so the public got it right in some there's ways. There's some debate about that, though, right? Or, yeah, or, yes and yeah. no. I mean, I mean, there's no question. There's some interesting things that happened with Sandy. Mm -hmm. Sandy strengthened when it went from sort of the Carolinas north up to New Jersey. Mm -hmm. It actually strengthened, and normally at that time of year in late October, water is pretty cold and it should weaken, it should disperse, and in fact it strengthened. It went from about 75 miles an hour in the core to about 90 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. That was because the water temperatures are off the coast were about four degrees above normal. Right. That's a big, four degrees Celsius, that's a very big uh, uh, pool of warm water that would not, not normally be there. The second big thing is that it took this left hook, it t t turned left into the New Jersey shore. It turns out that that's happened before, but it's very rare, it's less than 10% of storms move from east to west. Mo normally they would head north and, and move eastward out but to we sea. Had that big high pressure system, right? If, or, a big high pressure yeah. system, which scientists, and again, this hasn't been uh, confirmed yet, but the hypothesis is that this is actually connected to the retreat of sea ice up in the Arctic. Mm -hmm. And if that's really true, if the retreat of sea ice is essentially steering storms into the East Coast, that's a much bigger deal than any kind of intensification. And the reason is, people forget, Hurricane Sandy began with an S. There were a lot of storms last year. Yeah. Most of them head off to sea. Yeah. If we start steering storms into the East Coast, this could be really bad. Now, I, I think there's something else to reflect on, though. I think, I think uh, your discussion of resilience in terms of the hospitals is sort of interesting. And uh, I, you know, one of the things I learned from the course that Gerald and I taught together with a few other people was that actually the Dutch is probably not the right model for thinking about what we're going to deal with. The reason is, you know, we had the big dig here in Boston, but in fact, infrastructure, large infrastructure projects are very difficult in the United States. I actually think that, you know, putting up seawalls and big blockades all over the East Coast, it's just not going to happen. I mean, it just costs too much money. I don't see where that money is going to come from or the public will for that. Part of the problem is it's very hard to convince people to pay a lot of money for something that they may not need for 10 or 20 years. Yeah. It's, you know, so, so I actually think immediate post-Sandy is really an um, incredible opportunity. And, you know, what Rich and Paul are talking about in terms of, of what happens right after a disaster to think about what kind of investments in making your systems more robust, making the recovery more, hap more efficient, more making, building that resilience. Yeah. Um, and a lot of that's local. A lot of it's, you know, as you said, raising power, 
power systems from the basement up to higher floors, uh, uh, dealing with pumps, you know, putting more pumps in place so that after the storm does flood areas, you can pump it dry in a day or two instead of having it be flooded for weeks. Yeah. Those are things that really matter, and we have an opportunity to do that in a much more distributed way. It's not going to be all centralized and government funded. But as you say, the window is very narrow for doing that immediately after a, I think a storm. already now, yeah. here we are at this panel, mm -hmm. and the public is not focused on Sandy the way it was three or yeah. four weeks ago. Well, let's take, be, before we go get our first question from the audience, I just want to get from, from the folks who were really on, in the midst of it during the storm. I, I, Rich, what was, uh, what sort of innovations um, did, did FEMA deploy in this storm versus, uh, you know, previous storms? Well, we actually did a, a number of things quite differently. We actually, uh, for innovation, we actually uh, dispatched a team of folks to New York to actually do just innovation uh, that brought in people from outside agencies, which we really hadn't done in the past, everywhere from uh, the Harvard Humanitarian Project to people, Geek Without, Geeks Without Bounds, mm -hmm. to all sorts of different groups, some that I have never heard of, uh, mm -hmm. that actually came together, 30 different groups on the ground to develop. Uh, solutions in real time on the ground, mm -hmm. uh, s things of putting up mesh networks uh, in areas that didn't have any connectivity, mesh networks set up in Red Hook and parts of the Rockaways. Was uh, this done beforehand? This or was, was done on as, as, as it, it was, was happening, unfolding. literally yeah. Yeah. like a uh, day after dispatched mm -hmm. a number of people. In addition to that, we also did, did some uh, adaptability as well as is looking at uh, how we can take some of the resources that FEMA has into uh, allowing them to be utilized for a large number of people. One example of a program that we did was sheltering people in their homes. Um, mm -hmm. In the past, we hadn't really, we looked at people being sheltered in other places, uh, in shelters, in schools, wherever. But a lot of the homes that weren't totally destroyed, they had just lost power. And they lost power because Initially, the lines were down, but people getting connectivity to their homes. For example, having uh, salt water came into their homes and their electrical boxes got, you know, had to be totally replaced in some of the wiring. Uh, in the past, we hadn't really looked at a way we could deal with that. We had individual assistance that we could mm -hmm. give people, but we looked at our public assistance policies to how we could look at that as a shelter in place. And so we took some uh, innovative ways and, and actually used our lawyers. And lawyers and innovation usually don't go together, uh, but this time they actually did. Uh, to find a solution to the, uh, a problem so people could stay in their homes. We'd get power back on and, we'd give, and they'd get, uh, uh, for example, up to $10,000 just to get their electrical heat, uh, yeah. power and heat and hot water back in their home. And there was a whole, there was a, a number of different things that we did yeah. uh, literally in order to respond. Some we had tried before in Isaac, some we had utilized in Joplin during the tornadoes in Tuscaloosa mm -hmm. the last few years uh, and brought a number of them together. Yeah, so this is a first real field test of a lot of these uh, for, for things? Some, or some were brand new together. that yeah, uh, the yeah. innovation team developed, the STEP yeah. program that uh, sheltering in place, as well as sort of how we responded to some of the political needs of having high-level uh, personnel with mayors and yeah. uh, borough presidents. How did that look on the ground when you, when you arrived? Um, I'd love to get your impressions of I, how things were orchestrated. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it, I arrived uh, about uh, within 24 hours of, of uh, when the, the storm made landfall mm -hmm. uh, and some of the uh, some of the utility systems and others uh, were having some of their biggest challenges. And I, I think one of the things you see is great success was actually the contingency planning itself. Uh, that I mentioned the challenges with hospital evacuations uh, in Katrina. And I think, um, though unfortunate, it was remarkable how quickly and how efficiently the hospitals were evacuated in uh, in Manhattan. Mm. You know, Bellevue, the flagship hospital of the of the Health and Hospitals Corporation, municipal hospital there, a 700 patient hospital, 25 stories. Uh, patients were carried down 25 stories. Uh, there was not a fatality uh, in that evacuation. The same with New York Langone. Um, and, and I think to carry out evacuations of that size in that speed was absolutely remarkable. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's the contingency planning, it's buying devices, it's having plans. Yeah. You, when I got there, uh, some of the other facilities were also starting to fail, some of the nursing homes, uh, adult psychiatric homes, others. Um, and the city had worked very hard to create special medical needs shelters and basically recreate the medical care in gymnasiums and armories, other places. Uh, and this is something that, again, uh, previously has been done really ad hoc. Mm. Uh, and, and, you know, it's very hard to take someone with a lot of medical needs and just put them in a shelter in the middle of a gym. There's been a lot of planning for the medications, for the food service, for the, the, uh, the, the medical health of these patients. And I think, though certainly it was a chaotic scene, as all disasters are uh, yeah. in the immediate aftermath, 
uh, there was a, a remarkable amount of order that was already imposed on some of that chaos yeah. uh, and, and some plans that were well underway. But as you said before, it, it, it could have also been done earlier. Is that not the case? Or, or I, think, I think that's one of the fundamental questions we're wrestling with. Yeah, I think yeah. um, there's no question that people need to consider uh, the severity of events like this uh, more thoughtfully than I think we ever have before. It's a gamble. It's, it, it's a, yeah. Correct. Uh, and the more... Uh, the, the more prepared we are to stay where we can stay safely, I think the better mm -hmm. we are for our, uh, in the health system. Yep. Uh, again, evacuating 10,000 patients is, is absolutely dangerous and disruptive, no matter how good you are at it. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, no one wants to put patients in harm's way either. Um, and so you're, we're really trying to find that sweet spot of understanding the threat of, of improving our defenses as much as we possibly can, uh, but also not, not staying past when it's safe to do so. And, yeah. And that, that's that's the question that we are absolutely wrestling with uh, right did, now. Did Bellevue do everything it could to prevent this in the first place? It seemed to me that there was some some faulty planning on the in terms of their backup generators and thinking about how they would be affected. Yeah, you know, I, I suppose I can't comment specifically on Bellevue in that way, but but I, I would say more broadly, you know, Bellevue had made tremendous strides, as I said, moving generators up to the 13th floor. Uh, but unfortunately, what didn't come up were the fuel pumps and the transfer switches. And the other um, problem is not every building has a 13th floor. Well, correct. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So I'm going to turn it now to... Just, oh, yeah, sure. One yeah. comment on this, yeah. though. I think that the, the, the point is, is to say this is, you know, many, many millions of dollars to undertake these uh, sure. to undertake these changes. And, you know, for most hospitals, you're in the 10 to $20 million range. If you're an older and a bigger hospital, even more. And this is not funded by anyone but but operating expenses. That's right. And so for and it's almost... it's not in their main... It's not part of, of their core mission. Uh, right. as, as someone said in the press, you don't choose your hospital based on where their transfer searches are. Um, and so I think most hospitals are really trying to do this. Uh, they're trying to improve uh, their resilience. Uh, they're trying to improve how prepared they are for disaster. Uh, but you can't do it on a dime. And, and uh, I, I uh, think it's wonderful that, that Bellevue has been in process. I think it was tragic that they got hit before they were fully transferred. Yep. And you also Sorry. have to do all this in, in the face of a lot of uncertainty, right? Which is what we're... Exactly yeah. right. So uh, are there questions here in the audience? Yes. And first, I want to thank you for your participation today and also for your great service and dedication in helping the victims of Hurricane Sandy. When I think about the role of the Harvard School of Public Health, I think about their charge for the training and education of the local and state public health workforce. So I'm going to direct this question to uh, Dr. Lucero and Dr. Benninger. Thinking back over the past, say, month and a half, what areas do you think the school can focus on in training our public health workforce to be more capable and prepared themselves for handling some of the uh, problems that come up and services that need to be delivered during an emergency response such as the I would say two things come immediately to mind. Uh, the, the first is risk assessment. Um, I think we all by, by nature are actually pretty terrible at risk assessment. Uh, some of us tend to really uh, worry most about big, scary things that are incredibly unlikely, uh, and some of us tend to worry more about things that are very likely but not all that dangerous, com at least compared with the big, scary threats. Um, and I think if you're in a position of leadership, um, you need to be much better educated about how to approach risk. And this really gets back to what we were just talking about is if I'm one of the New York uh, hospital officials or if I'm one of the uh, state health officials and I'm trying to decide should I evacuate or not, I have to be very methodical and very uh, thoughtful about how I'm going to consider the different variables involved uh, and, and try and be as evidence-based as possible about how I'm going to make a decision like that. So I think we really need to train our leaders uh, in informal risk assessment in a way that I think allows them to deal with a great number of variables, some of which the data is, is very hard to, to obtain. Uh, and the other comment uh, that I would say is really to, to function well in a system, uh, as Rich can probably attest to much better than I, um, the system is broad and there are so many partners and you need to work with emergency managers, EMS officials, fire officials, public health officials if you're in a hospital. You have to be able to understand sophisticated weather analyses uh, and predictions and you have to be able to function in this community, in this system well uh, because staying siloed and only knowing what you know and making decisions only based on that limited amount of information j just doesn't work anymore. The, this, the world is just much bigger than that. I think. Um one of the biggest challenges, specifically at the state and the local level, is it's no secret the public health 
uh, across the country has received cuts over the last number of years in trying to find the ability to look at emergency preparedness and look at how that can be an actual um, benefit in non-disaster times, how you can look at the ability of how to integrate it across disciplines. I think one thing in emergency management that we've looked at uh, over the past few years has been how emergency management is not just FEMA. It's, you know, urban planners. It's across the spectrum. It's public health. And how do we bring people into realizing that that's a key part of emergency management is what their specialty is. In public health, uh, knowing very well from the local level uh, how important emergency preparedness is, and but how you have to integrate it in these times of really tight budgets across throughout all areas of public health in the role that it plays, whether it's healthy baby, healthy child. Well, how does that tie to disaster preparedness? Very much so because that's going to be probably the most some of the most vulnerable populations and how you can help prepare people for our disasters when people go out and doing the home visits with uh, healthy babies is how you can do a little bit, not making a whole big deal about emergency preparedness, but simple things to make sure that they're ready in looking at that and how to integrate that across all different aspects of public health because when a disaster strikes, it touches all parts of public health. Were there other? Sure. Um, Greg, you know, there's a mic work. coming your way. Um, Greg Reno, I'm at the School of Public Health uh, here in the uh, GHP department and do research for the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, as Mr. Serino mentioned. Um, I tend to work more in humanitarian populations, and one of the concerns is that the humanitarian crises of the future will be in places uh, very much affected by, by climate change, and, and, and maybe that demographic, as Dr. Benier mentioned, um, much less able to respond, at least monetarily respond or move. Um, it seems to me that the disciplines of climate, uh, climatology in particular, the models, are, are, have gotten very, very precise. Uh, they're highly mathematical and, and maybe much more developed than the discipline of epidemiology and the study of populations. Um, and maybe this goes back to talking about, you know, can we really well ahead of time identify populations at risk? So I, I'm curious to hear uh, from the professors in particular how we might be able to bridge this gap a bit better with climate uh, climatologists um, and epidemiologists, and maybe it's the siloing of the disciplines, as, as Paul mentioned. But uh, I'd be interested to hear, even in the planning process and and uh, and from the climatologists in particular, how we might be able to get climate models to the epidemiologists to really evaluate risk well ahead of time. Dan, you want to jump in on that? Well, I, I think this, there's an ongoing discussion. Actually, I think I think for the first time. We're actually seeing a lot of conversations between disaster, the disaster relief community and the climate community, the climate science community, both meteorologists who actually do predictions of storms, uh, specifically storm tracks and things, and climatologists interested in climate change on a sort of longer time scale. This spring, for example, the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative and the Center for the Environment that I run are actually having a summit on climate and, and disaster preparedness. So, so this is actually something that's, that's really happening in real time. Um, that being said, don't um, have too much uh, uh, overconfidence in the skill of the models for the climate. <laughs> um, one of the things about climate change is that you know, the Earth is changing in ways that it hasn't for literally for millions of years. And um, however good our models are at predicting storm tracks and things, I promise there will be surprises. There will always be surprises. And we're talking about a system that's getting worse and worse and worse. And, and um, uh, you know, boundary conditions on the Earth's climate as a whole that we haven't seen, that no human has ever observed before. So there will always be mistakes. There will always be surprises. And um, you know, so somebody might predict a 10-foot storm surge, and you get a 13 or a 14-foot storm surge. And when that happens, communities that you didn't think, you thought were actually well prepared, suddenly everything falls apart. And, and I think uh, uh, no matter how well we prepare, um, there are going to be breaks. There are going to be systems failures. And when that happens, um, uh, the question is how do we respond? I'm also interested in the, in the more, in some ways, a, a planning approach, which is to say, each of those opportunities is, is, is actually the time where capitalization is done. It's the disaster relief that we, is going to provide the dollars that are going to build in adaptation on the long run. And so, and so what's very important every time, and right, and right now it's not really codified in the rules, mm. 
We rebuild, but we don't necessarily rebuild better. And it's really important every time there's a disaster in any part of the country, whether it's a drought or a heat wave or a forest fire or a flood or an earthquake, that, that we make sure that it's an opportunity to raise the building codes, to actually raise the bar on the standards of all types, because that's the only time we're going to have the money to do that. Why haven't we been doing that until now? I mean, we've, we've had s similar conversations before, although we, we tend to be synthesizing these things around climate change now in a way that maybe is new. But, you know, look, uh, the climate discussion has been around for 40 years. Why are we so, why well, are we still talking remember about Remember first that climate is still a politically contentious mm -hmm. issue in this country. But second, I think there's a more f simple reason, just in terms of disaster relief. Um, we're a country filled with compassion. When we see a, a community suffering, the foremost thought in our minds is to make sure that that suffering goes away, that we come in with, with fixing their electricity, fixing their, their, the safety of their communities, um, giving them, turning their heat back on. Um, this happened a year ago in Connecticut during the big ice storm. And we don't, you know, in, in, the, in the heat of that moment, we don't necessarily, or cold of that moment, as the case may be, um, we don't think about, oh, we really should be raising the bar. Um, it's hard to do that when people are suffering, to say, well, I mean, politically to say, you know, we're not going to give you relief money unless you actually build, rebuild a little bit better. Sometimes or, or perhaps even leave that. Well, that's the other right, thing. Right. And, and, and actually, um, the, the keeping people out of harm's way is a, is a discussion that's much more difficult politically. Mm -hmm. And we have to start talking about things like insurance, right? The question yeah, of federal yeah. flood insurance, federal crop insurance, and issues like that that really do in some ways guide long-term decisions on where people see, live. I know you want to jump in. I just want to see if we have a question from the online audience, and I'll circle back to this. Hi, we have a very active chat going on online, uh -huh. so I just want to ask some of those questions. Uh, the first one, what is FEMA doing to inform home homeowners and volunteers about the dangers of mold, asbestos, lead when conducting cleanup? A, a number of things. We actually have uh, teams that have gone out into all the affected areas that are working with us, uh, specifically with the state and then in New York City and the cities and the counties as well, because a lot of these are specific issues um, in the that the city has to deal with to get permits for people to go back into, whether it's from public health, whether it's from the local uh, electrical, uh, to get permits to go back in. So what we've done is put a lot of information uh, out to people to make awareness, whether it's um, on not just websites, but actually going door to door to let people know. And then also when they uh, register for individual assistance, uh, we make sure that we give as much information as possible, whether it's uh, mold or whatever other issues may be. Um, and one of the things that we've been working with a lot of the voluntary agencies to go into homes specifically to, to pull out and help what they call muck out the homes to get the wallboard out, to get a lot of that out early on uh, to, to get the mold out. And that message actually spreads uh, as quickly through official as well as unofficial uh, methods because some, some of the people had experienced flooding before and just on the second or third day we were actually in the rockaways and there was still four feet of sand and people were uh, in their homes and people were mucking out their homes because their neighbors had told them you have to get uh, all the wallboard out and worry about mold and pull things up. So the word was, was spreading pretty quickly uh, but we continue to make sure that that happens and try to get as many resources through voluntary agencies as well to help people muck out their homes I think is, is one of the keys is to continue you know both through you know social networks through you know websites through many different ways and also what we found is sometimes word of mouth works is one of the best ways. Thank you. Was there another one? Or I, I, there yeah. are a lot of questions here <laughs> so I'll well, ask I, just one more right now. Okay. What are the differences between population resilience and infrastructure resilience? How are, the, how are they the same and how are they related? Mm. Well, I, like I actually think sometimes, I think, I think maybe the person asking the question is using the term resilience you know, in a common way, but actually uh, I I in some ways it's not really the definition. Um, uh, there's a distinction between robustness, that is making, resisting the damage, versus resilience, which is really about recovery and, res and rebound. So, you know, the way I like to think about it when I give talks to the public is, you know, in the Terminator movies with Arnold Schwarzenegger, the first, the first robot, Arnold Schwarzenegger, he's robust, right? You can, bullets bounce off of him, right? He's a robot. Um, the second Terminator is the liquid metal guy who you, you know, shoot a bullet in and a, and a hole goes right through him and he comes right back into shape. He's resilient. And that difference, you know, it turns out both are important. 
because we need to be able to build our strength to resist the storm damage. But we also occasionally, as I said, are going to suffer flooding. And when that happens, you need to make sure that you can pump yourself dry and that you know it's a it, you can recover actually quickly and get back to normal quickly mm -hmm. and and both and, and there are investments in both that are quite different so so you know in terms of infrastructure um, we think of large infrastructure really is about um, uh, uh, robustness but in fact resilience is important too so for example in the New York subway system you could try to build a seawall to keep the New York subway system from flooding or put borders around the subway entrances. That would be pretty challenging. Another way to do it is to in install lots and lots of pumps so that when the city does flood, when the subway system floods, you can actually pump it dry quickly. That's an investment in resilience. And, and the truth is a, a combination is really required. Mm. Which sort of circles back to your notion of raising the bar and, and the hurdles to being able to raise that bar. Uh, and I think, Gerald, you were, you were jumping in there because it, it deals with adaptation. Well, when Dan was talking about, you know, we're a compassionate nation and it's hard when people are suffering to make the tough decisions, mm -hmm. it's also very hard to make the tough decisions when people aren't suffering Even because harder. they aren't suffering. So why should we actually be <laughs> making these decisions? I mean, we can have all of the evidence in the world. And yes, we need evidence-based studies on the epidemiological side, on, on the climate change side, and you know, develop absolute precision in our beliefs about what's going to happen. But then you take all this data and it's coarsened in the policy making and political system where it really finally doesn't matter. If we finally have a sense that there is going to be sea level rise, there are going to be these permanent and temporary events, and events like Sandy, whether we tie them in or, or out of climate change, there are going to be events. And so we are going to need to start to deal with these sorts of things. And of course, we have this enormous political challenge of not wanting to spend money on things that we're not absolutely sure about, but even if we were, they're well into the future and let somebody else solve that kind of problem, as opposed to actually spending money today. Because there are real costs to this, high dollar costs, and there are winners and losers. And so whether it's telling people they can't develop where they had developed before, or telling people that over the next 10 years you have to retrofit, that's all going to cost money. My own sense is that when we build infrastructure, when we build new, when we renovate, obviously, those are the opportunities, independent of any worry about a specific event, to begin to armor ourselves or to become resilient for the future. And that, hopefully, will begin to become part of the zeitgeist in localities and states and at the national level. Mm -hmm. But it's easy to sit here and say those things. And the challenge that we have, not just in climate change, but on anything that costs money, is the political debate. Do, one one thing I think that's, that's important is to realize that you know, you had mentioned earlier, how's, why is it taking us so long mm -hmm. to, to do this? Well, actually, we have. And I think that a lot of times people forget about a lot of the things that have happened. Um, for example, if you look in the state of Florida, uh, after the hurricanes in the 90s, they changed their building codes at the state level and the local level. And you see uh, homes that are much more resilient, that are able to, you know, actually survive storms, that actually have that. You actually see not building directly on the waterways. You actually see that local, at the local level, that they t took the initiatives at the state and the local level to pass new ordinance, the building codes, to actually see those differences. Um, sometimes we, ha we, you know, going uh, around the world to look for solutions I think is great. We found some great solutions, but sometimes we just have to, for hurricanes, we have to go to the Gulf Coast. Mm -hmm. They've survived many hurricanes, they've changed a lot, that we have not had maybe as much in the, up here in the Northeast to look at how we're able to, to right. build a, a bit more resilient, to look at like places like Florida, some of the other states that actually have done that. We learned in New York, they learned, we learned in Boston as well from what happened in Katrina, mm -hmm. from where, you know, electrical, whether it's generators, electrical, boxes you know you don't see too many new facilities that are you know in hospitals certainly being put in a lot of it in the basement mm -hmm. um, and I think as we go forward I think there has been uh, a lot of progress made there's still an awful long way to go there are you know a lot of you know as, as we rebuild in certain areas certain things we ha we spec uh, stipulate where they have to be so there's a, a lot that has happened there's still a long way to go but I don't want people to think that nothing has happened sure well that's a very good point I think I think we have to think about some of the driving forces behind those long-term changes in building codes and standards 
Um, I think the insurance industry is incredibly important, and we're going to have to have a debate about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, Office of Management and Budget estimated over the last, I guess, a, a year ago, they estimated that we've been spending about $11 billion a year in disaster relief. Um, that's just by the federal government. That's not state and local expenditures. That's a lot of money, and it's going to be more. And if you look at the private insurance market, there are many systems where the private insurance has basically just said, we're not going to actually insure this. The state of Florida, for example, now is basically backing um, uh, storm insurance for the whole state. Mm -hmm. It's not clear that they actually have the resources to do that, but they are basically doing it. Um, so the question is, if a really big storm hits Florida, will the state of Florida actually have the money to actually make good on that promise? Um, I think a, a deregulation of insurance is about to be underway, which is going to actually force things. You know, a lot of these investments in resilience and in robustness, sump pumps in people's basements, yeah. you know, it, it may be required by your homeowner's policy soon. And that, frankly, is a very effective way of delivering distributed action in preparedness. What about that uh, argument that, that uh, subsidized insurance has contributed in some ways to the to our uh, a certain recklessness in uh, building in coastal areas um, and and not building well and if we kind of left that to market forces uh, we wouldn't have so much built up territory I don't know if Gerald maybe this is something well that we we have a, a, a property rights oriented approach quite frankly to all areas including coastal areas the very notion that you can continue to build and rebuild and rebuild until actually you know erosion causes your house to fall off the cliff is probably not the most intelligent way to go and yet one can't overlook that sort of cultural orientation uh, what, whatever it is about about Americans perhaps and I don't know that we need to make it a cultural thing uh, that's just an empirical observation and it's, it's simply very, very hard to, to finally tell people that you're going, there's going to be a sort of rolling easement, which is one of the policies that yeah. is now being discussed, yeah. where, in fact, you know, you have to stay a certain distance from the water no matter what, and it keeps rolling back. Well, if it rolls back too far, you no longer own your private property. <laughs> so private property itself becomes one of those kinds of impe impediments. Mm -hmm. Obviously, having the market price correctly, what the risks are, and not having everybody bail out that person, is, is an obvious kind of thing. And yes, there's been some progress in that direction, but still it's amazing to me that there is a subsidy for locating in what are vulnerable or problematic areas and everybody else pays. Mm -hmm. How does that compare? In, well, did you want to? Well, I, just, I, I think you know, one of the challenges is that I think we need a different message when disasters happen than we're going to help. Uh, and, and this gets back to the compassion argument that I think everyone who's involved in emergency response and emergency planning wants to be there and reassure uh, the victims of a disaster that we're there to help and that is what we do and and, and I, we should be, be proud of our nation's efforts but we also need a message during time of a disaster because as was already said that's the only time unfortunately people listen but is that we all share responsibility and I think uh, there have been a lot of things uh, and again Rich can actually comment uh, on this but locals and states uh, I think now understand more than they used to that there is no uh, white knight that's going to ride in after a disaster and make it all better that, that they share in uh, that they share in local preparedness and response the way the federal government does, the way individuals do. And I think when disasters happen, I think we actually need to do a better job on the, on the planning and leadership side, messaging to the public that we all share in this responsibility and now is the time to start preparing. And whether it's put in a sump pump, have a better home disaster kit, update lists uh, so that you can be in, in touch with loved ones, We've got to do it right then because, as, as we've already said, we're going to lose the attention of the public quite quickly. Mm -hmm. And is that, how does that compare to, say, the Netherlands in terms of, do we need something even bigger than Sandy? Do we have, need a more existential threat before we actually start to raise the bar in ways that a country like the Netherlands? I'd hate to say we need it. Yeah. Uh, and again, uh, it, it, as Dan pointed out, the Netherlands is not the model it, mm. because every country has a contextual situation and when you've been living with water for centuries, I think in your DNA, uh, you have a different approach to water than what we might have in this country. But I'm still curious about whether the emergency responders will ever be able to say, you know, out of their sort of profession, no, this time, you know, we warned you last time and, you know, you've got to just live with this condition now, finally, in a very different way than you've ever lived with it before.
because we, we set this up in advance. So when the next disaster hits, will both of you be saying to people this time, no, we're, we're actually, we, we can't help you. And we told you last time, we warned you, yeah. you know. Rich, can, can FEMA deliver that kind of, <laughs> that kind of tough love? Is, is FEMA? Well, I, I think one thing we, we are not gonna do is when a person's in their time of need, and it's not really FEMA, it's more the state and locals, uh, and having been one for years, when somebody is in their time of need for life-threatening right. situations, we're gonna, people are going to go in. Uh, however, we are not going to go in, you know, when it's not safe. Um, and whether it's a, you know, it, those are almost all local decisions. When the wind gets to a certain level, uh, the water level gets a certain level, you're not going to be able to go in to do it safely. Uh, but once that recedes, then people will go in and do rescues. I think that that's just, uh, you know, it's built in our DNA that we are going to go in to help save somebody's life. That's right. um, and I think you're going to see that um, probably continue. Uh, do, do, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, and uh, still continue with a lot of preparedness messaging. And a lot of folks that were evacuated um, ahead of time, and actually very few, if you look at the large numbers of people that were evacuated, both in Irene and during Sandy, people listen now a lot more than they did be in the past. Mm -hmm. People are listening, people are evacuating. Uh, so you don't have as many of those rescues that are necessary. So I think, you know, when it comes to uh, life saving, life safety, it's still going to happen. But the question really is in the next phase, right? The question is when it comes to reconstruction and rebuilding. That, that's and, and we spent a lot of money rebuilding New Orleans below sea level. A lot of people were saying at the time, this is a mistake. And, you know, so far it hasn't happened again. But if it does happen in the next few years and New Orleans floods again, there, it's not clear the country will be ready to rebuild it a second time. Um, and I think the question is, you know, when it comes to rebuilding the Jersey Shore, when it re comes to rebuilding Staten Island, are we actually going to just pay for it? Are we going to actually subsidize rebuilding essentially in harm's way? Or are we going to insist that the standards go up? And that's really a question mark. I think before We're we not even that, built. we, we want to be able to get a couple more questions in. So are there any here? Uh, sure. Why don't you go ahead? Hi, um, my name is Nicole Lespie, and um, I've had previous experience in intergovernmental uh, organization that dealt with emergency disasters in the Americas. And I was wondering, um, it was mentioned briefly before, how much um, we can learn from other countries, um, learning from the Gulf cities. Um, how much are we learning from you know, other emergencies that happen in the Americas, and then how much are we taking what we've learned here and being able to create some sort of system of shared information, not only between different governments, but also you know, the International Red Cross and other organizations that deal with emergency disasters. That sounds like rich, sure. maybe? Or sure, I think uh, uh, n numerous different ways. I think that we have the opportunity to learn, and we have learned from other countries in the past of things that uh, have gone well or things that haven't gone well and how we can incorporate some of those. Have we done as well as we can? No. And I think that's one of the things that we're actually working on is how we can actually look and expand what we can learn internationally from our, uh, from our partners literally around the world. Also, and how we can share what we've learned as well. There's a number of uh, different groups that we have that we're able to learn from others and share our experiences. Uh, we have a number of agreements with a number of countries uh, literally around the globe of when an emergency happens of how we can learn, learn from them. We've sent people, for example, to Japan. We've had people um, that have gone to Israel. We've had people that literally have gone, obviously, Haiti, a number of other places that we've had people to go and as much offer our expertise, but as much learn from them as to what works as well. And I think one thing that's important is how we can learn uh, from a lot of other countries, um, especially perhaps some third world countries, as to how we're actually able to look in what, what they've done uh, well that we could incorporate in this country. And uh, one example of that is in Haiti and distribution of how we're able to distribute food throughout uh, the area of Haiti. Uh, one of the most effective ways turned out not to be, surprisingly, uh, tongue-in-cheek, was to have uh, large numbers of, uh, you know, whether they U.S. international aid groups come in with large amounts of food and go through their system to distribute the food. 
Uh, lots of problems happen with that, whether it's from uh, people trying to uh, steal the food, whether it, where it's gone, but the food that was distributed through local faith-based communities uh, in Haiti that had their own networks pre-established and built was the most effective way to distribute food. So we're actually looking at how we can adapt that in this country, whether it's through food banks, whether it's through faith-based community, as well as some of the ways that we do as well. True, it's two different uh, countries, two different ways, but some of the systems that are in place, some of the informal networks are in place are certainly things that we can learn from, we have learned from, and we're looking at doing that. We now have food that we have around the country. We used to have them in uh, large distribution centers, which we still do, but we also now have them in food banks. And unfortunately, pretty much in every community in this country, um, there is a faith-based, you know, whether it's a church, synagogue, mosque, and in most of those, they have unfortunately food pantries to serve the uh, people who need help now and guess what during a disaster those are the exact people that we're going to need to link up with and, t and help with feeding with sheltering of the same people so let's utilize the networks that are in place now and and how we can bring them together that's just one example but there's many many more Paul I, I think the other thing is this, this is exactly the the space that academic institutions should be filling is that um, you know, we, we really have a great difficulty sometimes even defining the data elements of response uh, that we want to measure. Um, and there have been uh, people who proposed something like an Utstein uh, style uh, data collection measure. Utstein is the way in which people define cardiac arrest data in the medical world. We should do a similar standardization of data data, uh, of data from disasters, excuse me, um, so that we're all talking the same language when we say I'm going to collect this interval, this decision, this uh, way of measuring communication. Um, and it's really the space for academic institutions like Harvard to, to do this. The other thing that, that academic institutions have uh, is, is, is people who can respond. During disasters, as you would expect, it's all hands on deck. And um, there's a lot of ethical debate about whether you can take disaster responders offline to collect data in real time. They really need to be doing their own jobs. Um, but if you don't collect some of this data in real time, you, you miss that opportunity to learn something that you otherwise will never learn retrospectively. And so it would be really great uh, for academic institutions to be able to fill that space, uh, and, and many of them are, including uh, Harvard School of Public Health, um, to, to get in there and learn those lessons in an academic fashion so they can be translated more broadly and really uh, relatively rigorously. Did we have another, another question here? Hi, I'm Josh Glasser with the Department of Global Health and Population here at the school. Um, we've talked a lot about the need for adaptation and the need for preparedness investments, and those can certainly be very cost-effective strategies, but they're also extremely expensive, and different households have vastly different abilities to pay for those type of investments. So how do we build kind of equity considerations into some of these strategies that we're taking in a proactive and preventative manner? That sounds maybe you, I Dan. Think, I think th that's a really important question, yeah. and I don't think it's one that we've answered yet. I don't think anybody has the complete answer to that. Um, I would say that there are a number of organizations out there who are thinking about this. For example, Enterprise um, uh, uh, is, a, is a large organization focused on l lower income housing, and they're very much in the middle of this discussion of adaptation and vulnerability, um, thinking about building low-income homes that are energy efficient, that have low chemical exposures, and also that are, that are um, resistant to damage from various types of risks. Um, I think uh, they're an example of an organization that's really spearheading this kind of effort. Um, but we have to think about this issue more broadly, because as you say, um, you can, you can uh, um, change insurance policies so that suddenly everybody's required to buy a sump pump except the people who can't afford it, and then, and then what do they do? Um, so I think, I think we have to think about that. And in some ways, that was really at the heart of what the debate about New Orleans was, right? There were people who said, why rebuild New Orleans? It's below sea level, it's a mess. And a lot of the communities that were actually in the most vulnerable places in New Orleans were really the poorest ones who, who couldn't afford to relocate. Um, now the truth is, a lot of them did relocate. A lot of them moved to Houston um, and didn't come back. And so uh, uh, that's going to happen. And we have to start talking about essentially environmental refugees because we're going to see more of them. I think we have time for one more question. And I'll ask this one because several people have been raising it. Which of the world's cities are most exposed to coastal flooding? Hmm. 
That might be you, Gerald. <laughs> Can you sum it up in a minute? <laughs> How much time do I have? We have about, about um, one about minute. A minute. <laughs> you know, it, you know it, it runs the gamut, of course, from what might be deemed wealthy cities, the most recent example, again, being New York City, uh, to, you know, the poorest cities. So uh, Bangladesh as a country, you know, has, of course, cities. And so you, you just go country by country. I, I'd hate to create a, a list of my favorites uh, <laughs> because it might suggest favoritism. Uh, it's, you know, it's the ones that are located near water especially, although that's not the only problem. Anybody who's on a, a river, for example, uh, is potentially vulnerable because one of the, the water events is actually increased precipitation. Um, and storm surges that, you know, when they go from the sea or the ocean inward, that also prevents rivers from dumping out. So there's flooding way, 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 way upstream. We so we forget that, you know, that earlier this year in January that we had essentially the entire city of Bangkok was, was evacuated. I mean, this was millions and millions of people had to leave. Uh, that was incredible. And yet for all of this, we just saw the, the global climate uh, negotiations and again without much commitment of any kind or or broad agreement so uh, you know I wonder how much longer we'll be having these sorts of conversations well haven't we booked this room for a year yeah. from now <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you this we're gonna be having this conversation for a very long time yeah. the reason is fixing climate change and we're never gonna solve the problem yeah. but, but limiting it is gonna literally take a hundred years we have to rebuild our energy infrastructure for the entire world that's a very grand challenge, and, and it will be with us for our entire lifetimes. Um, meanwhile, climate will continue to change and bring surprises with it. And so, so frankly, um, uh, as much f as we mitigate this, the, the, the ultimate problem of, burning, of releasing greenhouse gases and burning fossil fuels, we're going to have to adapt to climate change because it's going to be with us. Yep. Did you have? OK, I think that uh, that is a great spot to conclude. Um, obviously, an hour is not enough time to, to deal with all these important questions, but thanks to the panel for, uh, for discussing these things today. Thanks to everyone for coming and the online audience, and uh, I think we're done. Thank you.